Today, as we continue this series on the Hall of Flaws, I want to invite you onto a journey, okay? I want you to take a moment. You can close your eyes. You don't have to look at me. You can um, kind of get creative and imaginative in your mind. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to remember what you thought your life was going to be like. You can anchor that at a particular age, a particular season in your life. Um, When I was preparing the message, I was thinking about, if I look back at my 13-year-old shoes, I was um, in junior high and I was playing volleyball, that was kind of my jam, and I I had really big dreams, like collegiate-level dreams, which if you can't guess by my extreme height and athleticism, like maybe that wasn't what the Lord had. But in my mind, I was being recruited by a collegiate coach who used a high school team as a feeder, and she had petitioned the district for me to play as um, a junior high schooler on the varsity team, and that got kiboshed, which again may have clued me in that that wasn't the plan for my life. But sometimes we have these ideas of what the path before us will look like, and they may or may not be real or accurate. Later in life, those dreams looked a little bit different. Maybe um, that I would be married young and I would be done having kids by the time I was 30, right? That for some reason, 30 was like a big number in my head. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be all done with my family by 30. So you can imagine my surprise at 34 when I was in my third pregnancy, having lost a baby the year before and having just delivered my first three years prior and having married into a family of three kids. My life looked radically different than I anticipated or thought that it would. Many of these experiences might resonate for you in your own life. What did you think your future would look like when you were a teenager? Or maybe a young adult starting your career? Maybe your first few years as a wife or a husband, or what you expected retirement and a fulfilling career to imagine pointing towards something that you expected to be really beautiful. What promises were made or did you feel like were coming in your life that were never fulfilled or were perhaps delayed or came in a way that you would never have expected? Were there any illusions of grandeur in anyone else's mind, like my collegiate junior high dreams? As we've been traveling through this series, The Hall of Flaws, we've been considering those characters that are specifically called out by name in Hebrews 11 as examples of heroes of the faith. And yet, over and over again, as we dive into their stories and we uncover it, we realize that actually, like, how did they even make it on this list? Right? Has anyone else had that experience going, man, I don't know, their lives are full of mistakes and flaws, and we might be a little bit surprised. So this morning, we're going to dive into the story of Moses, and we're going to consider a few poignant inflection points of his life. Now, most of us know Moses as a leader of God's people, right? His name probably is not completely unfamiliar to you. He is, of course, the one who stood up to Pharaoh. He was an early representation of some of these really miraculous signs of God, And he also, of course, was responsible for delivering God's people out of oppression and into the promised land, right? A fulfilling warrior who led God's people somewhere they had never gone before. And one of his most well-known acts, of course, is his role in receiving the Ten Commandments directly from God, right, onto the tablets. And I actually found this really funny picture on (laughs) worldhistory.org of God, like, I'm sure this is a beautiful piece of artwork. It just seemed a little interesting and antiquated to me. But perhaps you're more keen on remembering Moses as the guy who stood against the wall of water as the Red Sea was parted, right? This is kind of what I think of him as this fearless man standing there as the waters parted. And he literally was about to lead his people through dry land, such a miraculous thing in and of itself. But I'm going to argue this morning that the inflection points that are the most important in Moses' life aren't these grandiose, wonderful, like miraculous movements of God on behalf of the Israelites, but that they look perhaps a little bit more like this. Can anybody see this is Moses fleeing and running away from the Egyptians, from the pyramids? And over and over again, we're going to look at where we see Moses doing exactly this. Now, I will tell you, I tried to do Chandice's cool thing where he did like the, um, the graphics on chat, GPT, you know, and I was like, John Cena running for as what? It didn't work, okay? I hit my threshold on how many images right away, and I was like, I guess we need Chandice to come back from sabbatical. I don't know. So um, in Hebrews 11, which we've been studying as the series, the the Hall of Flaws, we learn this about Moses. He's first mentioned in the book, not for anything he's done, but because of the faith of his family, the family that he came from. Hebrews 11.23 says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Next, we learn Moses refused to be identified with Pharaoh's family. It says, by faith, when he had grown up, 
Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And then the next, the very next thing we hear about Moses is summarizing the next 40 years of his life like this. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. And by faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn child would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And then, of course, perhaps the pinnacle of his leadership. Hebrews mentions the parting of the Red Sea. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Now, before we make assumptions about Moses, Moses, oh gosh, that's hard to say. Someone else say that. Moses' leadership. Ready? Go ahead. You can say it for me. Okay, thank you. So before we make assumptions about that, um, you know, that somehow it was marked by only these incredible moves of the Lord or this perfect leadership model, um, I want us to actually go back to the beginning of his life. And I want us to consider what Moses would have experienced as a child, what his experience as a young man in a bit of his own exile looked like, his formative experiences leading the Israelites, and then what fulfillment of his own promises that he had received looked like at the end of his life. One of the most important things I want us to key in on today is something I heard quoted by Rick Warren last week, and he said, broken trees bear fruit. Broken trees bear fruit. So I want us to have that phrase, that beautiful little synopsis of what I would consider a great representation of Moses' life, and also all of those that we're looking at in Hebrews 11, that broken trees still bear fruit. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance to gather together in your word, in your worship, in your, um, just your presence, God. We just praise you. We ask that you would be glorified in every single thing this morning, that our hearts would be lifted, our hearts would be um, quickened, our hearts would be restored in places they need it, God, because your presence is with us. You are alive and acting, our bodies, our emotions, our spirits, everything, God, that needs to experience the power of you today. We say, come and have your way, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's go back way to the beginning in Exodus 2. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we've got a bookcase in the back. You're welcome to grab one. Um, I like the experience of holding the Word of God in my hand as I go through things, but um, you also, of course, will have it on the screen, and you can use our app. The Bible is linked out from there as well. But Moses was born to a father and a mother who were both members of the tribe of Levites. And um, when he was born, the king of Egypt had given an edict to the midwives that any sons born to Hebrew women were to be killed. But it says that the God-fearing midwives did not do this. And so verse 20 says, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Now I was reading that and it kind of jumped off the page at me. I don't want us to miss the fact that these midwives were agents of multiplying God's kingdom, right? It reminds me a lot of the story that Mike shared last week where Sisera was killed by a woman who was completely outside of the Israelites to save the Israelites. And it just made me remember in this space, even an evil king's edict in the midwives not following that, that God can use anyone even evil Egyptian laws. Isn't that crazy to think about that the midwives were, God was kind to them and as a result, Israel flourished. Let us not lose sight of the fact that God literally can use anyone. Now his mother saw that he was a fine child and hid him. Verse three says that she prepared a basket of papyrus reed. She was weaving this basket together and covering it in tar and pitch and, and making sure that there was a space that would be somewhat safe for her son as she sent her baby out from her arms. Now I have a number of friends right now that some of you are experiencing this launching of your kids, right? A number of people I know that are launching into school, new grades, new life stages, college. I know there are many mothers this week that I've been talking with who are like, did I do enough of the, the preparation and the sealing in and the covering? And I couldn't help but relate to Moses' mother, even as we prepare to send our son into marriage next week to go, this is like those places that as moms, we send our kids and we can't go with them. Anyone else feeling that this week? 
Exodus 2, 4 through 10, Moses then is placed by his mother into the basket, floating down the river, and he's followed by his sister. And of course, we know the story that Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, sees this basket caught in the reeds and sends her servants to go and find what it is. They discover the baby, and of course, she correctly identifies that he is a Hebrew baby. Now, Moses' clever sister pops out of wherever she was following her brother, and she offers to Pharaoh's daughter to go and find a wet nurse, a Hebrew wet nurse, to take care of the baby until such a time as the baby could live in her home, in Pharaoh's home. So this is a pretty creative and clever thing that happens, right? Now, we have the luxury of knowing this story in hindsight, don't we? We know that Moses makes it. He becomes a great leader of God's people. But imagine how disruptive this experience in this moment is, not just for this sister running along the bank following her, her baby brother, this whole family. I mean, you've got young parents who are full of hopes and dreams for their children, what their family would continue to grow and expand and become. They have dreams that were disrupted by a powerful and fear-filled king of whom they had no authority over. A selfless act of the mother sending her child out into the unknown world, trusting that he will be cared for in someone else's hands. A sister grieving, responsible, perhaps just really clever and creative who followed her brother and then made a way for him to remain for some season at least intact in their family. The disruption for this baby being sent out and then returned to your family and then sent out once again at the proper age. Ruth Haley Barton in her book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, says, we might at least acknowledge that Moses' early childhood experiences were quite traumatic by any standard. He was born into an environment that was highly unsafe and volatile for children. He was abandoned by his mother, even though it was for the best of reasons. He was then reunited with his birth family, only to be returned to his adoptive fa family later on. Raised in a pagan environment that was fundamentally different from the environment in which he had spent his early years, an environment that prohibited him from living and worshiping with his family and his fellow Hebrews, according to the traditions of their own heritage. And he lived between these two worlds and yet was not fully at home in either place. What a disruptive upbringing. I wonder what Moses' parents had expected their young Hebrew son's life to turn out like. I wonder what Moses himself imagined what his life would be like as he was removed from his family and brought up in Pharaoh's home. I would call this season, this inflection point, one of preparation for Moses' call into leadership. This, this point where he's got this incredibly tumultuous upbringing, this in-between two worlds and this this preparation that God is doing in the disruption and in the unknown. Exodus 2, 11 through 25, then it fast forwards all the way into Moses' life and says he's all grown up now, okay? That's all we get about his childhood, and then he's all grown up. I would love to have heard, like, what happened to this Hebrew boy living in the, the king's home? Like, that would have been cool. Maybe someday we'll get that. I don't know. But anyway, so Moses is all grown up now, and he went out to be where his own people were, which means he's watching them enslaved to the Egyptians, building their, perhaps, pyramids, building their things, creating the, the straw and mud bricks, right? This incredibly tedious and demeaning work. And while he's there watching his people, he witnesses an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Exodus 2.12 says he's looking this way and looking that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, this is the epitome of what I would call premeditated murder, right? I, he's just enraged. He sees something. He's like looking, okay, no one's around. No one sees it. I'm going to kill the guy. I'm going to be, become a murderer, and then I'm going to go hide it and bury him in the sand when no one's looking. But in fact, we know it wasn't in secret. In fact, the next day, he's busted out by a couple of Hebrews. They're fighting, and he comes over to go, why are you fighting against one another? And the one looks at him and says, are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I, must, what I did must have become known. Have you ever had a moment like that, this type of Moses exposure, one where the weight of your sin or the uncovering of it just came crashing down upon you and filled you with fear? Or one where someone accuses you right in the most tender of spaces. Think about this. Moses, he knows he's done something wrong. He's trying to hide this. He literally became a murderer the day before, and now his own people are asking, now are you gonna kill me, you murderer? Right, what this must have done to Moses in his psyche. 
We see, in fact, it was not a very well-kept secret at all because, of course, then Pharaoh finds out, and then he tries to kill Moses in response to what had happened. So Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian. This is the second time, think about it, at least the second time, that Moses' death has been covered by a very, like, real death threat. That's kind of crazy, huh? This is, is a very tumultuous time. Once as a baby, now as a... Uh, an adult here. Ruth Haley Barton goes on to explain Moses' flaws in the most profound way. She says, all of us develop ways of adjusting and staying safe in the midst of whatever danger or difficulty is present in our environment. We develop patterns before we're conscious that we're doing so. It appears one of Moses' coping mechanisms was to repress his anger since he had nowhere to go with it, but he also used that anger to power up in relation to others and control situations that seemed out of control. One day his anger, anger that had probably been building for quite some time, got the best of him and everything exploded. When he saw an Egyptian abusing a Hebrew, his anger overwhelmed him and he killed the Egyptian. Then he tried to hide his sin by burying the body in the sand. This reactive and out of control response was a snapshot of Moses' leadership before solitude. Now, often we think of Moses as a young man here, right? It's fast forwarded from his childhood. And we think, oh, he's like a testosterone driven young man who doesn't know yet how to control himself, right? The truth is Moses was 40 years old at this point. When his anger overcame him in that moment of seeing the injustice, he was 40 years old, just a few years younger than me. I mean, some of us would be like, did you get it together yet, right? She goes on to say that Moses fled from the trouble. He fled into solitude. He didn't walk. He didn't jog. He didn't take time to figure out, wow, what happened? And get his life in order and get things handed off to other people. No, he fled into solitude. Parker Palmer in his book, Leading from Within, says this, a leader is a person who must take special responsibility for what's going on inside him or herself, inside his or her consciousness, lest the act of leadership create more harm than good. And I think Moses was confronted with the reality that in his life, he was creating more harm than good, and he fled. Now in Midian, he's sitting down beside a well, and seven women come, and they're, um, they're daughters of a priest, and they came to feed or to water their father's flocks. And there's some shepherds there, and they're harassing the women at the well. And Moses actually steps in in a moment of... Um, valor and he shuts them down. He rescues the women. And in the end, they take him home to their dad and he ends up marrying one of these daughters. And he spends the next 40 years of his life tending his father-in-law's flocks, Jethro's flocks, in the wilderness next to the mountain of God. The commencement of this point in Moses' life is exhibiting the most uncontrolled of behavior, sinning and committing murder, fleeing to Midian, going about his life, working a job, raising a family, doing all the things that all of us do, is what I would say we're entering into that second inflection point of Moses' life where he's actually being prepared to be called into leadership. There's this damaging thing, and then he's got this season of solitude where he's drawn out into the wilderness and called into leadership. In Exodus 3, in fact, we see the Lord shows up to Moses in a burning bush. Now, I don't know if you know this, there's actually bushes in the desert that like self-combust, like this is a thing. And I was doing some research about, there's a whole, actually a number of different, um, the YouTube videos are kind of wild with people trying to light their own plants on fire. It's, anyways, I didn't bring one of those because it wasn't very helpful. Um, but these bushes would catch on fire. So in and of itself, this isn't that unusual for Moses. What catches his attention in the ordinary is that this particular bush is in flames, but not burned up. It's on fire, but it's not consumed, and that catches his attention. God calls Moses by name in the burning bush, or from the burning bush. He tells Moses, this is who I am. I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then God tells Moses why he's making himself known. Exodus 3, 7 says, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Have you ever questioned if God is concerned about your suffering? Right where you are in the darkest of places, in the most isolated, solitude places that no one else can enter into, have you ever wondered if God was there with you, if he heard your cries, if he understood the oppression you were experiencing? I find great comfort in scriptures like this where we're reminded that God himself sees us. He sees me. 
He hears my cries. He is full of concern for our suffering. In the exact same way he was for the Israelites. That's so encouraging to me. So then after telling him why and who and and calling him by name, God then tells Moses, I'm calling you. I am going to come down and rescue the Israelites from these Egyptians. I'm going to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. This is the promised land. And then he says, so now go, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, if you don't know much about Moses' life, he spans a whole slew of books across the Old Testament. And I was thinking as I read through multiple books and was consuming like, gosh, this back and forth dialogue that we see between God and Moses and all of the things that unfurl. So I started thinking about those memes, you know, where people are like, so-and-so said this. And so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to really high level summarize uh, some of the un- ongoing interchange between Moses and God. So Exodus 3, 11 through 20, Moses says, in response to his call, who am I to do anything? God says, I'm with you. I will perform all kinds of miraculous signs. And in fact, I promise you that you're going to come back and you will worship God here on the mountain of God. Moses is like, uh, who are you again? And God says, I am. And there's so much theological depth. And I really don't have time to get into this, but I am who I am. If you want to talk about it later, we we can talk about it later. But moving on to Exodus 4, we see at this point we're clued into the fact that perhaps Moses is um, being confronted with something that doesn't align with the plan he expected for his life. Remember, he spent 40 years in Egypt before fleeing, then 40 years in his own experience of solitude in the wilderness and desert time, just him and God and his family removed. And I think we're beginning to see that perhaps Moses is running up against expectations that don't align with what he imagined at 13 or 20 or 40 or 60, because now he's 80. Clearly at 80, this is not apparently the the story he would have written for himself. In fact, it reminded me very similarly to when we studied Gideon, right? And the whole word of, um, excuse me, my Lord, right? Remember that about Gideon's story? Moses takes a very similar approach to God. Exodus 4, Moses is like, um, excuse me, God, what if they don't believe me? God says, hey, check out these miraculous signs. And then he actually has Moses do some of these things. He says, hold up your staff. And the staff turns into a snake. And and Moses runs from the snake, which is, if you haven't noticed, a repeated pattern, right? But then God says, go pick up the snake. And so he picks it up and it returns to his staff. And then God says, hey, check this out. Stick your hand inside your cloak. And he does that. And then he pulls it out and it's full of leprosy. And Moses is like, wait, you want me to be a leader now? You have to be a leper? What? And then God says, no, I'll stick it back in. And he pulls it back out and his hand and his flesh are completely restored. God's like, hey, if that's not enough, just wait, I've got more. You can gather water from the Nile and put it on the ground and when it hits the ground, it will turn to blood. So Moses in this convinced state, after hearing and seeing all these incredible things that the Lord does, uh, later in Exodus 4 says, um, pardon your servant, Lord. Do you remember I don't speak very well, right? I stutter, I falter, and God says, who gave you that mouth, Moses? Moses again, ah, oh, pardon your servant, Lord. Can't someone else do it, right? And God says, my anger burns against you, Moses. And Moses says, nothing. I wonder if he's like cowering or maybe he's trying to run again. Maybe he's like flinching, shrugging his shoulders. I don't know. And then God says, okay, how about Aaron? He speaks well, your brother, I'll call him in. You take the staff, you do the miraculous signs, and Aaron will speak on your behalf. So Moses, in his obedience, goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he says, hey, Jethro, I need to go see if any of my people are still alive in Egypt. And Jethro says, go, I wish you well, I bless you. And then God says, hey, remember, go and perform the signs I gave you. Oh, BT Dubs, I'm going to actually harden Pharaoh's heart, and he's not going to let the people go. At, at this point, what would you do if you're Moses? Be like, peace out. I... <laughs> Seriously, Lord, like you're, I, I finally responded and now you're going to tell me he's not going to do it and I still have to go. It might have been just a little discouraging, perhaps not how he imagined the interactions with Pharaoh going. So then he shows up in Egypt and he says, hey, Pharaoh, by the way, this is a different Pharaoh, not the one who was trying to kill Moses before. Hey, Pharaoh, with your hard heart, I'm going to kill your firstborn son since you won't let the Lord's firstborn Israel go. Now, again, this simplified story is... Um, 
it might tip us off that this is not an easy calling and it's probably not how Moses would have chosen to write the story if we had to guess. And quite frankly, he's not so sure that his own flaws can be overcome to actually step into what God is asking him to do. Fast forward, um, if I had to summarize like Exodus four into five, it goes like this. Moses and Aaron, they show up, they perform all these miracles. They're like, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know this Lord. I'm not letting my people go. Israel can't go anywhere. Moses and Aaron, okay, well, what if we just go for three days into the desert? We could go do this festival in the wilderness to our Lord and, and sacrifice to him. And Pharaoh's like, why are you trying to take my people from their labor? Get back to work. And in fact, I'm gonna make it harder work because you guys are lazy people. So rather than having the, the Israelites make the, their actual bricks with straw and mud that I provide, I'm gonna actually say, oh, now you have to go gather your own straw. This is gonna be much, much more difficult. Exodus 5, 19 through 21 says, the Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told, you're not to reduce the number of bricks required of you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them and they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you, people of God. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. We see the Israelite people themselves beginning to turn against God's servants, Moses and Aaron, and in their suffering, they accuse them of being their own agents of death. Now, I don't know what happened to Moses in those 40 years in the wilderness next to the mountain of God, but he's getting accused and attacked in exactly that same vulnerable space that his Hebrew brother poked at right after he became a murderer, right? This is incredibly painful, I would think, in one of Moses' most vulnerable and tender spaces. Now, I wanna give you some real high-level patterns of what we see happening over the next um, 17-ish chapters throughout Exodus, like five through, no, 12 chapters through 17. Um, and these are kind of the big level patterns that we see develop between Moses, God, the Israelites, and their oppressors, okay? We see Israelites blaming their suffering on Moses and Aaron, specifically, again, accusing them of being their agents of death. We see Moses then immediately in response, turn to God and say, God, help my people, Moses takes, rather than being defensive and wounded and hurt in this space where the Israelites are coming after him as a murderer, he takes it before the Lord in intercession. It's beautiful. And then we see God responds and Moses, at least early on, is still like, hey, I just want to remind you, I really don't want to do this. Do you remember that, Lord? Although early on in Exodus 5, that's actually the last time I see God or I see Moses protesting to God, I don't really want to do this. So something is changing and transforming in his own heart. Um, Moses and Aaron continue to do what the Lord tells them. The Lord continues to show up. And guess what the Israelites continue to do? Accuse Aaron and Moses of having the, the worst intentions, trying to kill them, trying to kill the entire assembly, trying to starve them in the desert, trying to um, on and on and on it goes, okay? Now, then we know, of course, God delivers them from the hands of the Egyptians. He delivers them. And God, Exodus 7 through 12, we see by 12, Pharaoh's had enough of all this stuff that happens. There's these um, awful plagues that strike the Egyptians and the Israelites had to live right alongside them in this space. That would have been a miserable existence. But we see finally Pharaoh had enough and he's like, get these people out of my home, out of my town, out of my area. In fact, we want you gone so badly, we're gonna load you up with every provision you could possibly Need. And so the Egyptians actually end up sending the Israelites out towards the Red Sea. God delivers them with abundance. Exodus 12, 40 says, has this very interesting line. It says, now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. 430 years. At the end of those 430 years, to the very day, all of the Lord's divisions left Egypt. Now, I don't pretend to know the, the significance to God of this very particular amount of time, why it was 430 years, but I will say it was significant enough that God drew attention to that. To the very day, God's timing was perfectly executed. And let us not lose sight of that as we watch for God's kingdom and his own deliverance in our lives. 
All right, Exodus 13 and on, they move. God tells them to do things. It doesn't make sense. They do it anyways. And then, it's, of course, God shows up, and it does make sense. Um, Pharaoh realizes, man, I just let my whole labor force go. Like, what was I thinking? And then they pursue the Israelites, and they come, you know, and Moses gives this inspiring speech, like, you don't need to do anything. Just stand, and the Lord will fight for you. Just be still, right? And uh, God goes, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell your people to move on. So interesting. So much, there's so much depth in this. I'm telling you, if you want somewhere to kind of dig in this week, go through Exodus 5 through Exodus 17. And then we see in Exodus 14, God has a plan and directs Moses and the angel of the Lord moves and protects the Israelites as they're standing with the, the Egyptians coming at them, pursuing them. They're standing at the edge of the Red Sea and it says that the angel of the Lord moved from in front of them, which was their direction to behind them and actually blocked the Egyptians from coming at them the whole night when the Lord was departing the waters and drying the land. And it said that this angel of the Lord provided light to the Israelites and darkness to the Egyptian where they could not see one another and God protected them. He covered them. And so the Lord is doing this incredible thing. He parts the Red Sea. They walk through and then Moses does what God says and then the waters fall and it actually takes out all of the Egyptians who were pursuing the Israelites. None of them survived. At this point, the Israelites see that the Lord is mighty. They fear him and they begin to put their trust in his servant, Moses. And this feels pretty good, right? This feels like an inflection point in Moses' leadership where, man, he's finally arrived, right? The people put their trust in him. They've done, God's done this incredible work and now they get to move forward despite all of his brokenness, despite all of his sin, despite the 40 years that he sent in his, of his own wilderness time being refined, being purified. Now at the age of 80, we see he's a reluctant leader, but one who's continuing to say yes to the Lord. And then what happens three days later, the Israelites go back to their former ways. Three days, the Red Sea just parted, guys, this crazy miracle. And then three days later, they're like, Moses and Aaron, why'd you take us out here to die, right? They turn towards revisionist history. They're like, hey, do you remember how great it was in Egypt? We would sit around the campfires and we'd cook meat in pots and we were merry and we were happy. We told you to leave us alone so we could just serve the Egyptians. Right? Like none of this really matches, right? At least it doesn't match God's account. They continue to quarrel with Moses and Aaron. Give us water to drink. Do the things we ask. We have no food. So God provides and continues in this unconditional, loving, gracious, merciful way to show up for the Israelites. In Exodus 17, we see a moment where there is no water. And as Moses and Aaron go before the Lord, he says, hey, do this. Take your staff and you can strike the rock and water will come out of it. And it did right? So this journey of Moses, all of his flawed choices that brought him to this place, the Israelites and their struggles to follow Moses, this journey from slavery and oppression to freedom and the promised land, all of this surrounded and carried by the unconditional faithfulness of a loving God. And this continues to play out. Now, I'm going to fast forward to two last spaces as we wrap up. Numbers 20, verse 2, we see that Moses experiences almost an a, identical situation to what he saw in Exodus 17. Now, as a leader, he might be like, hey, I know what this worked well last time. They're in this place again, okay? It says there was no water for the community. The people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron, and they quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died alongside when our brothers fell dead before the Lord, why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? There's no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink. And in response, Moses got so fed up. No, not really. Moses fell with his brother on their face before the Lord again in the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord instructed Moses to take the staff, gather the whole assembly and speak to the rock that water would pour out of it. Verse 11 says, then Moses raised his arm, struck the rock twice with his staff, water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. Wait a minute, that's not quite what God said to do this time, was it? He said, speak to the rock and water will pour out from it. And Moses was like, I know how this goes, God. We already did this in Exodus 17, remember? And he strikes the rock. And I wonder when it says he struck it twice, if that first time God was making a point, Moses, that's not what I said. 
He struck, struck it again and water did come out. But the Lord in verse 12 says, he said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Now this week, as we're thinking about Moses, as we're thinking about all of those others that we've learned about in Hebrews 11, I want you to go and I want you to search for something. Mike and I just got back from the Vineyard National Pastors Conference. And if you don't know that, I'm ordained through the Vineyard, Mike is ordained through the Vineyard. And this is a once a year opportunity that we get to see, you know, decades old friends in the Vineyard and gather together. And there was something like in the neighborhood, there were thousands of pastors there. It was a lot of people. And, um, but I want you to go and I want you to search for this very particular thing. And it's a conversation as part of the conference that happened between Jay Pathak, who's the national director of the US, Vineyard US, and Rick Warren. So if you just look up Jay Pathak, Rick Warren, Vineyard Conference, or Conference 2023, you'll find it. But in this interview that Rick did specifically for Vineyard Pastors, he shares this thing that I mentioned earlier, that broken trees bear fruit broken trees bear fruit. Around minute 15, um, and you can listen to the whole thing if you'd like, it's, it's kind of a challenge about how do we be the witnesses of God to the entire world? How as small churches do we stand and actually be what Acts 1-8 says that we're to be for our local community and this and that and that, right? And right around minute 16:45, Rick is sharing of his own story in his family about his son who lost his battle to depression and mental health illness. And as he's sharing that, he begins to share his own personal story of the people who reached out after his son's passing. And he shared that the most powerful part was that these people who were sending condolences didn't diminish the brokenness in his son's life. They didn't diminish his flaws. But he shared the testimony, these people in thankful, grateful hearts shared that in his brokenness, Matthew led them to the Lord. And it is the most beautiful, beautiful picture of God allowing broken trees to bear fruit. So I would just challenge you to, to go and listen to that video this week. It's just a real timely and personal kind of exploration of this idea that God can use whoever he wants. Let me ask you this, what do you think happened to Moses in those spaces, those 40 years of his own wilderness? The isolation, the, the hiding, the living under the weight of his past sin. Then what happened, what was God doing in his transformation? The 40 years of living as a leader, constantly accused and being torn down by his own people, trying not to allow bitterness and defensiveness to come up, but instead to implore the Lord on behalf of his people falling on his face over and over again before them. The patterns that I see emerge in Moses' life as he persevered through some incredibly difficult circumstances and he continued to pursue the Lord and say yes, maybe not always without some reluctance paired with it, but he continued to be faithful. He allowed himself to be transformed in the most flawed and vulnerable places of his heart, his soul, his emotion. He walked in obedience even when we see it was in direct contrast to his own expectations or desires. He offered what he had, allowing God to do the heavy lifting. When others would quarrel with him, he would petition the Lord on their behalf. What would happen on Facebook for, now, I will say I haven't been on Facebook in almost a year, but I know what's still happening on Facebook. And if someone began to accuse you and say bad things or say untrue things, like what's your first temptation? Oh, I got to set this, the record straight, right? I got to respond to this isn't true. I should make sure that they know that this isn't true. Or maybe it's the anonymous trolls who you never get to actually interact with. None of us is perfect. And Moses himself, he wasn't perfect, but he was surrendered and he was allowing himself to continue to be refined. At the very end of Moses' life, we see the fulfillment of Hebrews 11.39 that says, all of those who are mentioned were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. None of them had received what had been promised. How faithful are these people? It's not about how flawed they are or how great they were or what they did, but that God promised something and they were faithful in the midst of having not seen that promise come through. Deuteronomy 32, this is the end of Moses' life, and we see that God actually tells Moses, he predicts his death, and he says, Moses, I need you to go up onto Mount Nebo. 
climb the mountain, and he tells him, there you will die and you will be gathered to your people. You will see the promised land only from a distance. I will not allow you to enter into the land that I'm giving to the people of Israel. What do you think that was like for Moses? His very last act of worship for the Lord, his very last act of ministry wasn't one he, when she said, um, excuse me, Lord. No, it says he got up and all of Deuteronomy 33 is the chapter where Moses is blessing the people of Israel. It's beautiful, blessing them with a full heart of goodness for all of the Lord's kingdom, all that he has over them, this rebellious accusatory people who have tried to take him out many times. He blesses them as his last act of ministry. What the Lord must have done over those final 40 years of Moses' life. And then Deuteronomy 34, it says, Moses climbed Mount Nebo. Then the Lord showed him the whole land. This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I've let you see it with your eyes but you will not cross over into it. Have any of you ever experienced this sort of situation where you know God has promised something, you know it's to come, and yet you're not potentially gonna get to see that in your own lifetime? Verse five says, And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. As the Lord had said, he buried him in Moab, meaning the Lord himself buried his servant Moses. He was 120 years old when he died. Now, I will just make this little observation. Had Moses wanted to protest the Lord's final direction and final decision over the end of his life and what he got to see, what he didn't get to see, what he got to put his hands to, what he didn't get to put his hands to, you better believe we would have heard it, right? I mean, amen, this is a man who was not a wallflower. He was very quick to go, um, pardon your servant, Lord. What about this? Even when they didn't line up with Moses' expectation. Hebrews 10, 22, 23 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance of what faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our waters washed, I mean our bodies washed with pure water. So as we finish up this morning, Amelia, I'll invite you and and the team back up, but I want you to consider what it means, what, what this thing in Hebrews means that we can draw near to God with a sincere heart, full assurance that faith brings us freedom from our sin, being cleansed from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. We're gonna get to witness that next week in baptisms, right guys? This is the stuff of the kingdom, and yet, where in your life do you find resonance with Moses' story? Where do you find resistance in the way that you see he lived his life? Would you have written the story that the priest that would lead God's people out would have been a murderer? Would that have been how you wrote the story? Maybe in your own life you're realizing, I wouldn't have written my story this way. My question is, what might God's better be for you? Maybe your expectations, maybe there's an invitation today for your expectations to be reset, surrendered, brought before the cross. We're gonna stand together and we're gonna finish worshiping this morning. If you're able and would like to join us to stand, I just wanna encourage you, we have lots of ways for you to respond to these places. We've got communion available up front and on the sides by the cross and on the prayer bench over here. Um, We have the cross itself where you can bring things, perhaps God is calling you to lay something down and bring it to his cross and surrender it there. I would invite you to do that. I would invite you if you have sin that needs to be wiped away and cleansed in your own life, things maybe that like Moses you fled from or hidden under, hidden from all of your life, I would invite you to not miss out on the freedom, the full assurance of faith that his cleansing brings. And maybe some of you are finding yourselves in a season like Moses where you're sitting on the side of the mountain and it's so close and you know 
it's not quite there or you're not going to get to be a part of that and that's really heartbreaking but i would encourage you we'll have members of our prayer team available members of our staff available to to sit with you in those spaces to pray with you if there's anything that the lord is dialing up or inviting you into inviting you to lay down inviting you to partake of we would just invite you to not miss out on the fullness of what he has this day